to worship. We do hope that you'll take a card out of the pew in front of you and fill that out, whether you're a guest or a member, so that we can have a record of your attendance. You also could respond back to your church bulletin if you have subscribed to that and let us know that you were here as well. This morning, let me start with this quote from Dan Quayle. Who's old enough to remember Dan Quayle? Okay. Dan Quayle once said, we're all capable of mistakes. But I do not care to enlighten you on the mistakes we may or may not have made, if you remember the whole Iran-Contra. Well, let me tell you, this morning, I am capable of making mistakes. But whether or not it was actually my fault or not, I will not confess. All of that to say that the lesson this morning will make much more sense if you get the right title, which is... Do you want to be healed, not do you want to be saved? So there might have been a mistake in that translation this week. And so as we worship, I hope that you'll look for the healing that you'll find in our songs and our worship time together as we share that. If you would stand and greet someone around you, and we'll continue in just a minute.
as he cries out to Father in heaven, we ask you to help us to appreciate that you have adopted those of us who are believers into your family as your children. Help us to put aside our egos and pride and only try to bring glory and honor to your name every day in all that we do. I pray that you will bring our country back to the principles that it was founded on and bless us as you once did. I pray for all those that need your special care in dealing with problems. We pray for Margie and Bunny and Mike Brooks as they deal with the passing of our brother Lloyd. We pray for Mary Martin, for the Bobby McAllister family, for Megan White, for Jim Montgomery, Carlene Kessel, for Jane and Dal Smith, for Sarah McMinn, Roberta Bradley, 
Willis Owen, Tommy and Linda Horton, Brian Price, and all those that are dealing with health issues. Pray that you'll be with Steve as he brings us the lesson this morning. Help us to appreciate the love that you had for us that allowed your son to go through all the pain and suffering that he did so that we might have forgiveness of our sins through the blood that he shed on the cross on our behalf. Please draw us closer to you and help us listen as your spirit speaks to us every day and to act on his message to us. Forgive us of our sins. Draw us closer to you every day that we live. We pray all of this through the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's stand again. Your light broke through my night, restored exceeding joy. Your grace fell like a rain and made this desert live. You have turned. Yeah. 
Those who get to spend a lot of time around me in class, you know that I don't use notes very often. You know that I don't write things down or pull things out to read unless it's scripture from God's word. This morning I'm going to do something very different. It is within time and space that one searches for existence. Understanding, however, finally presents itself beyond what can be seen or touched. It's ironic that we have always contained within us, by way of creation, all knowledge of who we are, our purpose, and our destination. We were never able to arrive at this understanding on our own, but by God's choosing. We were embedded with the knowledge of eternity. This depth of knowledge cannot be removed from our being, but we can lie to ourselves and pretend that he does not exist. Lies lived long enough become our reality, which is so altered from the truth that finding our way out is impossible for us to do alone. It's here in this darkness that a shepherd comes searching for the lost lamb bringing light and illumination to a hopeless situation. Calling our name, he is a beacon in the night, a lighthouse on the shore, a redeemer, Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me, please? Father, thank you for the mercy, the incredible mercy you've had to this earth and to all of us, your children, and sending the gift of your son. Thank you for his willingness to bear the burdens he bore while he lived here, to come to this world to walk among us, to show us how to live and how to love, to show us your nature, and to show us how much that you and he truly care for us. Father, we meet around your table today. We meet around this extraordinary time to sit together and to share to remember what he did for us, for his life, for his death, and for his resurrection. 
Father, at this time we pray for the bread which represents his glorious body, a body that he allowed to be nailed to a cross on our behalf, a body that was broken and beaten, which bled for us, a body that we cherish, Father. Thank you for the time we have to sit together and partake of that bread. Be with us now, Father, as we do so. It's in your Son's name that we pray. Amen. sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. It soothes our sorrows, heals our wounds, and dries Lucado called him the hound of heaven to always come looking for us no matter where we are would you pray with me please father we think about as your son our savior hung on the cross we think about nails driven we think about blood which poured from those wounds we know what it is, Father, ourselves to bleed. We know how important it is for that blood to remain inside of us, for life to exist. We know the stress we feel, Father, if we bled seriously. The fear of 
wondering about life and how fragile it is. And we cherish the fact that he was so willing to bleed for us. Father, we ask it as we partake of this cup which represents that blood, the blood that he willingly volunteered to give. Father, we ask that you would be with us. Thank you for such a gift. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior. The hope of nations, Savior, He can. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, heroes and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. I surrender all. Stand, Savior. He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. Light and 
appreciate so much the, um, the picture that Mark painted for us before the communion of the sheep in the darkness, lost, doesn't know where to go, and along comes a Savior, the shepherd, and rescues that sheep. And I would, I would encourage you to, to keep that picture in your mind as we go through the lesson this morning. Actually, I, I could be done right now, Mark. Uh, we could just go home, but... <laughs> well, I've worked really hard on this, so... <laughs> I want to begin this morning by stressing that the elders have called this congregation to a time of prayer and fasting as we envision our future and how we fill this pulpit. It's a way for us to prepare ourselves. It's a way for us to submit to God's leadings uh, for this congregation. And I can only imagine what would happen that if, if after a prayer, a time of prayer and fasting by this entire congregation and submitting to God's direction, to God's guidance, uh, it's, it's amazing to think where he will lead us to. We'll continue in our Dinner and Devo series this July, but starting in August, we'll have a new set of Wednesday night classes, and as a part of that, and as a part of the elders' call to prayer, Tim Logan is going to lead a Wednesday night class in prayer. The thought here is not necessarily to teach about prayer or to go through the different prayers that, that Jesus prayed, although both of those good, are good things, but it's a time meant to simply come together and pray uh, for the things that trouble us, for the things uh, that, that we need God to step in and lead us through. So if you need a midweek boost, I would encourage you uh, to come join us on Wednesday nights. Another class that you see up there that will be a part of this lineup starting in August is a, is a class that I will be teaching on my recent visit to Israel. My plan is to take the eight Wednesday nights in August through September and walk through the eight days that we were in the country of Israel and show the different places we visited. And I hope as we go through that series and look at the places to be also to able to provide some, some biblical insight to the different things that went on there and begin to provide the opportunity to, to take these pictures and places and put them with Bible stories in real places. That was one of the most rewarding things to me uh, on the trip. It was absolutely incredible to sail on the Sea of Galilee and to think that this is, this is where Jesus sailed. This is where Jesus calmed the storm. This is where Jesus walked on water. It was incredible to sit in the Garden of Gethsemane at 6 a.m. amidst some of the same olive trees, they say, that were there when Jesus prayed. And to be just in silence. And to think about Jesus praying there some 2,000 years ago before his arrest and trial and crucifixion. Another one of the places that we visited while we were in Jerusalem was the pool at Bethesda. And if you will turn over to John chapter 5, that is where we are going to spend most of our time this morning. But before we do that, uh, let's go to God in prayer. God, I just want to pause uh, and thank you for today. God, thank you for all the ways that you bless us. God, I thank you uh, that you are a shepherd looking for lost sheep because we need you, and we need your rescue. God, as, as this congregation goes through a time of prayer and fasting, I pray that you will just watch over us, that you will lead us, that you will step in, intervene, and, and take us to where you want us to be. 
God, I pray that as we look at this story this morning of the invalid pool, that you will just open our hearts and minds, that you will speak through me and, and help people come into a closer relationship with you. God, in everything that we say and do, we pray most of all that you will be glorified and that your name will be lifted up. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Bethesda means house of mercy, and it is a fitting term for the man that we are going to find in this story. He is looking for mercy. We find him sitting at this pool in hope of a miracle cure. This pool at Bethesda contained two large pools. It was near the Sheep Gate, one of the entrances to Jerusalem. Today it is adjacent to the modern-day church of St. Anne. It is believed that this is where Mary, the mother of Jesus, was born. Anne was Mary's mother. This area also contained five covered walkways. Only one of the pools has been fully excavated, and that's what you see on the screen. But it was really cool as we stood at this place, just in other places, to know that this is where Jesus stopped and performed this miracle in John chapter 5, and it really made that come alive. So if you'll look at me in John chapter 5, we're going to read those first 17 verses and then begin to, to look into these passages. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roof colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I'm going down, another steps in front of me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said that to you? Take up your bed and walk. Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterwards Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well, sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was the way the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. Now there's a lot that goes on in these verses, and we will really only touch the surface of it. But let's take a look at this man's story, and then I want to find an application for us today. Jesus, as, as we read at the start of this, comes to Jerusalem for a feast. We're not sure which feast. Maybe it was the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Tabernacles. Those are the two that most believe it possibly could have been. Uh, we just don't know. But, but he is submitting to, to his Jewish heritage as he comes, and John shows us a lot of these feasts that Jesus attends. This was early in his ministry. We don't see the crowds flocking to him. We really don't even see a mention here that his disciples were with him. He will only heal one person at this pool. And it's interesting that the man that is being healed here does not even know that it is Jesus who makes him well. That's not the occasion that we see in, in other passages of Scripture. In many other places, if we read through there, it is the faith of the person that brings about the healing. For example, in Mark 5, the woman with the blood discharge, Jesus says to her, your faith has made you well. To the Canaanite woman whose daughter was possessed by a demon in Matthew 15, Jesus says, Great is your faith. To the centurion with the paralyzed servant, Jesus would say, With no one in Israel have I found such faith. That's not the case here. Whether this man had faith or not, he does not know who is healing him. He does not know it is Jesus. Jesus simply displays his sovereignty here to heal the man, the man who had no idea who he was. As we read further in, in this passage, we see that this man's condition was caused by some type of sin. We're not told exactly what happened or how it happened. Did God actually paralyze him or cause him to be an invalid because of sin? Or did he receive this condition as a result of some sinful act? We're not sure. But based on Jesus' words, there was something that happened 38 years ago that caused this man to be crippled. 
possibly the result of a poor choice, a choice that had haunted him for the rest of his life. So Jesus says to him in in verse 6 of this passage, do you want to be healed? And as you think about that, and you think about this man laying by the pool for 38 years, you think, "Ah, Jesus, what kind of question is that? Sort of like asking a person that is shivering coming in from the cold, do you want a coat? Or someone that may have been in the desert or out in 90 degree temps and 90 degree humidity, do you want to drink a water? It's the type of question I was asked a lot or that I thought was similar to a question I was asked growing up, do you want a spanking? Why, yes, I think I do. And could you really make this a good one? My worst nightmare came true not long ago when I asked the same thing for one of my boys and realized that we do become our parents. Of course this man would want to be healed, right? Well, maybe, but maybe not. Maybe after 38 years, he had gotten comfortable in his situation. Maybe there were people that knew his circumstance and people that helped him. Although maybe not a great situation, he had survived 38 years. And as you read some of the commentators about the poor of this time, you will find that that for them it was not all that bad. And this man had positioned himself at a gate where there was a lot of people coming in and going out of Jerusalem. And if Jesus were to heal this guy, there was going to be ramifications for him. He could no longer depend on his paralysis as an excuse, as a crutch, as a means to get sympathy or anything else that would come along with that. With this healing would come responsibility. He would no longer be laying by the pool. He was going to have to get a job, go to work, and make a way for himself. The responsibility was now going to fall on him. So possibly this is not that crazy of a question that we see Jesus posing to this man. And maybe it was even a question that pierced to the center of his heart and exposed the motives that lay deep within his soul. The man does not answer Jesus' question, but instead he gives an excuse. The later translations omit verse 4. I've put it up here on this next slide to read through it because it gives us some insight into the man's response. The verse says that the the, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed were waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred the water, and whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was healed of whatever disease he has. This part has been omitted in, in most translations because many believe that a scribe came in later and just pin this in to help explain the situation. It does, however, give us some background to the man's response to Jesus and the cultural thought or superstition of that time that these waters had some sort of healing power. The other thing we notice as we read through these verses is that Jesus only heals this man on this occasion. In other places, as we read through the scriptures, when Jesus goes and heals, he heals the multitudes. I believe he picked this particular man for many reasons. First of all, if this man was healed, everyone was going to know it was a miracle. This man had been paralyzed since before Jesus was born, 38 years. So if he is healed and if he is walking, there is no way that this was a setup. There is no way this is nothing more than a miracle healing. Jesus is also setting the stage here for what I'll call a discussion in the latter part of this chapter with a group of Jews that were seeking to kill him. In healing this man on the Sabbath, and in telling this man to take up his bed, he is setting up a confrontation which he'll address in the second half of this book. But that's a lesson for another time. I also believe that Jesus knew this man's heart. And when he asked the question, do you want to be healed, I believe he already knew the answer. And so Jesus gives this man a threefold command. Get up, take up your bed, and walk. Get up simply because I, Jesus, say you can. Guys, that is powerful in and of itself. To think that Jesus could speak the words and this man could be healed. Is there anyone else other than me amazed that a guy after 38 years is simply going to stand up and walk without any type of physical therapy or occupational therapy or anything else. And even if he had walked 
before of the situation that had caused him to be an invalid, you don't just stand up after 38 years of being crippled and begin to walk. Have you ever had a broken limb? I was a casualty not many years ago here on the basketball court and ended up with a broken arm. No one has ever confessed to who cut my legs out. So when we do the invitation a little bit later, if you're here and want to come forward, you can. <laughs> six weeks in a cast, another six weeks of physical therapy to retrain the muscles and tendons in my arm, and that was not a big break. And now this guy, after 38 years of having atrophy in his legs, which may have been nothing more than skin and bones at this point, is simply going to stand up and walk. The second thing Jesus tells him is take up your bed. There are certainly Sabbath issues here as Jesus is making a point for discussion later, which we discussed. But he is also telling this man to take his bed with him. He is no longer going to need it at this pool because there will be no need for him to return to this pool. He is healed. Jesus is removing the excuse and the possibility of a relapse. The third thing that Jesus tells this man is to walk, to move out, to be transformed, to do something with your life. It would have been very easy for this man to dismiss Jesus and to dismiss Jesus' healing of him. It took more strength and courage to obey Jesus' seemingly impossible instruction, to walk above the level of his sin and accept the healing that Jesus offered, than to just keep lying by this pool this was going to be quite a change for this man as he goes from 38 years of lying by the pool to walking. His entire life is going to change. Now I believe that there is a message just as relative for us today as there was 2,000 years ago for this man and all those who witnessed it. And I don't think that there is anyone here this morning who has laid by a pool for 38 years like this man. But I do believe from a spiritual standpoint that many of us are dealing with issues that are crippling and issues that can cause us to be spiritual invalids. So in the second half of the lesson this morning, I want you to think about the sin that so easily entangles you. And we're not going to go around and, and ask for confessions at this point, but I really want you to be honest with yourself. What is the sin that trips you up or that you may find yourself engulfed in right now? I read an interesting article earlier this week that stated that one of the words that is disappearing from church lingo, from the church vernacular, is the word sin. Caught my interest, so I read on. The article basically stated that people no longer want to discuss or deal with sin and the consequences of it. So we are categorizing it as something less troubling, deciding to tolerate it, and since we have lessened the harshness of the description, we feel better about ourselves. That's scary to me. It's scary to me that we would water it down. The Bible states we all sin. And if we are going to get well, if we are going to receive healing, then we have to begin to ask ourselves some really tough questions and not avoid the issue of sin. And, and please note, and, and I say this in all the classes, most of the lessons I teach here and, and that I teach in classes, they're for me. So I don't ask this of you without asking it of myself. So I have to ask myself and you have to ask yourself questions such as, what is the one thing that Satan continually puts in your path that causes you to stumble in sin? What is your spiritual pool at Bethesda? Where is the place that you are stuck? What is the thing upon which you are fixated? What is the one thing or false hope that causes you to take your eyes off of the Lord. And why can't you get over it? Do you want to be healed? Maybe, but maybe not. See, sometimes I think we try to hide behind or to hide in our sin. We try to look good on the outside to others, but deep down we don't want to deal with the ugly sins like addictions and our modern day idols and other sins. And it's not necessarily even the bad sins as we like to classify them that may have us paralyzed. It's the respectable sins. What do you mean by that? I recently purchased a book titled Respectable Sins, Confronting the Sins that We Tolerate. 
fascinating book. It speaks to the things that Bible, the Bible calls sins, but we tend to overlook because they are not nearly as brazen as the things that our society does that makes the 5 o'clock news. But we have to realize that all sin is serious, and all sin is breaking God's commandment, and all sin is deserving of his judgment. In his introduction to the book, Bridges writes this, Some years ago, a book was published with the title, I'm okay, you're okay. In contrast to that book title, the attitude of many Christians seems to be, I'm okay and you're not. That is, we seem to be good at seeing other people's sins, but not our own. We see and bemoan bemoan the flagrant sins of our culture, and we're even quick to point out the sins of our brothers and sisters in Christ, but we're often blind to the more subtle sins that we tolerate in our own lives. I call those, those I call respectable sins. You and I may actually be doing quite well when it comes to avoiding the more overt sins, but what about the more subtle ones, the respectable sins that can still hinder our walks with God and harm our relationship with others? God has made clear in his word that he is dishonored and displeased by our anxiety, unthankfulness, frustration, selfishness, impatience, and discontentment, as he is by the overt sins that we are so proud to avoid. Here is the full list of sins that Bridges discusses in his book. Ungodliness, unthankfulness, anxiety, frustration, discontentment, pride, selfishness, impatience, irritability, anger, judgmentalism, sins of the tongue, envy, jealousy, worldliness, the lack of self-control. Now, I don't know about you, but some of those hit a little too close to home. They are struggles for me. I have issues with anxiety. I am not the most patient person in the world, and that's just the start of my sins, but I said this wasn't going to be confession time. These respectable sins just as much as the flagrant ones, can paralyze us spiritually. They can cause us to be spiritual invalids. And often they paralyze and we don't even realize it. And because of that, I believe that quite often these are worse than the sins that we classify as bad. Because if we don't realize our sins and we continue in them, they have control over us. We are doing nothing to stop them. Satan is crafty. And so he convinces us that these sins aren't that bad, at least not as bad as what everyone else is doing, and so we continue, and worst of all, it becomes commonplace. And maybe we even begin to justify it in our own minds. Or maybe it's the case that we know we're in a sinful condition, and maybe guilt shames us into praying for forgiveness for the same sins repeatedly, but it isn't enough to make us act and to give up the sin. So in essence, we really don't want to be healed of the sin. Sometimes it's easier to let bitterness fester and to wallow in the hurt and the betrayal, licking and liking our own wounds. All too often, we hold tightly to the things that paralyze us spiritually. I honestly believe that Jesus walked up right now and said, do you want to be healed? Many would say, what do you mean? Healed of what? It's the other people that have the problems and are struggling. The first step in spiritual healing is to come to grips with the fact that we all have issues and that we all need God's mercy. I mean, I would encourage you to go home, take out a list or take out a piece of paper and write down the sins that you struggle with, especially the ones on a recurring basis, and then pray. Pray to God to help you deal with those. Pray and take confidence in the fact that if we have the courage to act, Jesus can heal us of those things. But understand like the man in John chapter 5 that we will be left without excuse for our lives and the choices that we make. No longer the opportunity to say others are to blame. Just like him, we have to take responsibility. And if we're willing to be healed, then I believe the three commands that that Jesus gave to this man apply to us today. Get up, simply because I, Jesus, say that you can. But instead of getting up from physical paralysis, we need to figuratively get up from our sin. Take up your bed. 
If you really want to be healed and receive grace and bask in the freedom provided, then take your bed with you. Burn the ships. Blow up the bridge. You no longer need it. There is no reason for you to return to the pool. You are healed. And this is huge because how many times have we walked away from a sin but left a path of breadcrumbs to allow us to go back and walk in newness of life. Jesus calls us to move out, to be transformed, to do something with our lives, to move along in our spiritual formation, to get along on the road of our spiritual journey, to make a difference with our life. It's all too easy for us today to dismiss Jesus and his ability to heal our hurts, just like it was for this man. It takes strength and it takes courage to obey his seemingly impossible instructions, to leave the hurt behind, to walk above the level of our sins and to allow Jesus to provide the salvation that he offers. I love the way the author of Hebrews states this in Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, to me, the writer of Hebrews here is giving us similar instructions to what Jesus provided to this man. He says, throw aside the thing that weighs you down. Get rid of the sin in your life. Take up your bed. And instead of saying walk here, he says run. Fixing your eyes on Jesus and do not stop. Because Jesus took it all the way to the cross and finished the race. And we are called to follow his example and do the same. The message this morning is simple. If you are struggling with this sin, with the issues that you have chosen not to deal with <clears throat> or that you have hidden behind, then do something about it. Take the initiative to confront the sin and allow Jesus to heal. For the paralytic in John chapter 5, 38 years of disability are removed simply through the voice of Jesus. The God of mercy comes to the house of mercy and this man who had no chance of ever being healed is healed and he walks away healed physically and I also believe spiritually and the question that should reverberate through our heads is the same one that Jesus asked to this man do you want to be healed do you really want something better or are you willing to stay in the place where sin has got you all tangled up we have to think bigger than ourselves and we have to look to the God of mercy. He knew this man's story, and he knows each of our stories and the things that we have been struggling with. He knows our pains, our sorrows, our worries, our anxieties, our reservations. He knows all those things that keep us paralyzed. The same voice that healed the man at the pool of Bethesda can heal us today if we will call on him and put our trust solely in him. He loves us too much to leave us in a broken condition, but there has to be a willingness to be healed, and it's going to require action on our part. You know, the elders I mentioned have called us to a time of prayer and fasting. During this time, I pray that it will also be a time that, that as we dive into those two things, that we experience a time of self-examination and a time of healing from the sins that plague us. It's an opportune time for all of us to take up our beds and walk. If you're in need of prayer of this congregation, helping your struggles, you can walk down front as we sing in a minute. We will pray with you. We will love up on you. It may be the case that this right now is not the time or location for you to publicly address that problem. If that's the case, I would encourage you to call me, call Lincoln, call one of our shepherds, call someone who can sit with you, talk with you, and help you deal with that issue. Most of all, call on our Savior, call on our shepherd, Jesus Christ, to rescue us. Be in prayer. If we can help you in any way this morning, please come.
as we stand and sing. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, bruised and broken by the fall. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pardoning love for all. He is able, he is able, he is willing, down no more. He is able, he is able, he is willing, down no more. Come ye weary, heavy laden, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love and power. He is able, he is able, he is willing, doubt no more. He is able, he is able, he is willing, doubt no more. Saints and angels, join in concert, sing the praises of the Lamb. While the blissful courts of heaven sweetly echo with His name, hallelujah, hallelujah, here we now His love proclaim. for just a minute. Steve, I'm glad we didn't leave earlier. Amen? Amen. Hey, wow, that was big for around here. <laughs> Whew. Stay, Steve, also, in the words of Dan Quayle, it may or may not have been me who cut your legs out and broke your arm. I, <laughs> it was... Hey, thanks for being here this morning. It's been a real blessing to be together as always as we close these reminders. Tickets for dinner in Adiva are on sale in the adult ed lobby right out here. The menu this week is spaghetti, salad, and garlic bread. TCM Terrific Tuesday this week is at Southern Adventures at 10 a.m. Cost is $8 per person. Don't forget to sign up to have your directory picture taken. Sign-ups are in the adult ed lobby or you can call the church office. We'll be back together again tonight at 5 for our monthly instrumental praise and worship time. It's going to be 95 degrees out, so you've got nothing else to do. Just come on back at 5 o'clock. It'll be nice and cool in here. Uh, Camp Nayati, today is the deadline for camper registration. Parents, today is the deadline for camper registration. Forms are available in the gym lobby and church office. Teen counselor and adult counselor registrations are due by this Wednesday July the 16th. I do hope you have a great day and a great week as you consider your sin this week. Let's close in prayer. Thanks for being here. Will you pray with me? Dear Father, we praise your name, Lord. And as we uh, leave these walls, leave these doors, uh, go with us. Uh, you have equipped us. We are prepared, Lord. May we go out and make a difference. May this community feel your love because we are intent on sharing that. May people we meet this week see something in us that they need in their lives. Not something of ourselves, but something of you. Your spirit, your love. May we truly go out and love people and make a difference. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>